Hi, I'm Lee Storo, Policy Director at Community Education Group. Community Education Group is a nonprofit focused on tackling the syndemic of HIV, viral hepatitis, and substance use in Appalachia and rural America. I'm here today in DC at the O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health Law, speaking with Secretary Cody Kinsley of the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. Secretary Kinsley, thank you so much for taking a couple minutes to sit down and talk with us about HIV treatment and prevention. It's great to be here, Lee. So World AIDS Day is December 1st, and it always provides a valuable moment to reflect and think about our work in HIV treatment and prevention. When you think about the work you're doing around HIV in North Carolina, you know, what are your goals and what are your hopes for the movement? It's amazing that we have had so many advancements in therapeutics, but where we continue to languish is in the social determinants of health and continuing to support people with access. You know, we've got 1.2 million people in North Carolina without health insurance. That makes it incredibly hard for them to get access to the tools that would help both prevent and treat HIV and could end the HIV epidemic as we know it. North Carolina put out a plan to try to chart that path. And core to that work, I think, for all of us is to continue to meet people where they where they are and supporting them to get access to health care, but also, you know, transportation and interpersonal safety and housing and food and all the things that drive health overall and across the lifespan. Awesome. Now, I know you're specifically here in D.C. because you're meeting with the Food and Drug Administration to talk about the ban that gay and bisexual men still have that three month limit on their ability to donate blood. Can you talk a bit about why that issue is important to you and what advocates should be doing on fully repealing the gay and bi blood ban in 2023? You know, there is no substitute for blood. And, and I think back to high school when I started donating blood. It's, it's an opportunity, it's a civic duty in a way that you can feel connected to people, that you're helping someone else at no cost to them um, and at a very li little cost to you. Um, and unfortunately, at the core of this blood ban, we still say that, you know, gay and bisexual blood is dirty. I mean, that is the frame that comes across from the ban when we know that dozens of other countries have already moved forward in a science-based way to move from who you are to what you do and make a risk-based informed approach, which is really what we need to do. So I was heartened, um, you know, around Pride, the FDA commissioner announced a very a focus on this, uh, w watching the advanced study. I, I sent a letter and was uh, joined by 10 other health secretaries across the country earlier this year, calling on a move forward here. And so looking forward to an update. That's why we're here in town. So one thing that I think has a lot of advocates in this field really excited about and energized is this new tool, new funding stream, which is the funding hundreds of millions of dollars from these national opioid settlement um, funds. You know, hundreds of millions of new dollars will come into North Carolina over the next 18 years. What do you see and what are North Carolina's plans when it comes to utilizing this money? You know, I think there's a couple things that to remember here. First and foremost is that, um, you know, this money really needs to be used in evidence-based strategies. And so, you know, we've got to make sure that, uh, you know, we're using it to, you know, harm reduction, connecting people to care, syringe exchange programs, education, et cetera. The second thing, however, is that, you know, if we're using this money for treatment, which is an important opportunity, um, you know, we're gonna run out of it really quickly. I mean, treatment, especially for substance use disorder, is a chronic disease. It costs a lot of money over a long period of time. And you know, I spend 40-ish million dollars of federal funding already a year to treat about 14,000 people. You know, it's a drop in the bucket. North Carolina is behind the curve because we haven't expanded Medicaid. So we'll probably have to use a bunch of it locally for treatment. Um, if we can expand Medicaid and then we can put this money into employment supports, transportation, all those social drivers, we can really scale this over the next several decades in a way that will really help communities heal. And we know that's what we need to do. Awesome. And so last question. So our, our emerging virus in 2022 was monkeypox. I will say a lot of my friends who are not in the public health space have been kind of joking that like monkeypox is over, right? It doesn't feel like it's a thing anymore. These rates have declining. You know, what do you, you've been a national leader on this. You've been very vocal about the need to combat monkeypox. You know, what do we need to be thinking about in this broader syndemic space and intersection with HIV about combating monkeypox in North Carolina? You know, more than half of the monkeypox diagnoses in North Carolina um, were co-occurring with HIV-positive individuals. I mean, you know, 
you know, more than 90% of cases were in gay, bisexual men and transgender individuals, um, more than 70% in black men in particular, right? So there's a lot of disparity no matter how you look at this. The good news is that I think our messaging um, has driven some behavior changes that I don't think is the long-term goal. We know the most powerful tool here is vaccinations. Uh, we've got an effective vaccine. It's a two-course regimen. Um, while cases have tapered off for a period of time, I really want folks that are in the eligible groups to get vaccinated. It's your best way to, to prevent, and so we can try to keep this disease at bay. Uh, I think we will see spikes of it over time like we do with other um, illnesses. And if we can keep the vaccine levels higher, um, then we can manage this over time. But it, I, I think more importantly, it reminds us that viruses have long preyed on the most vulnerable in our communities. People that are often pushed to the margins because of lack of healthcare access, lack of food, and you know, and they take advantage of those lack of access to, to spread more rapidly in those spaces. Uh, and so we shouldn't you know, fault those individuals. These are systemic drivers, and really it helps us refocus what we need to be doing. I think it's the core of what you do is trying to support uh, where all these pieces come together. Awesome. Well, Secretary Kinsley, thank you for your leadership. Thank you for taking a couple minutes to chat with us. You know, there's a lot of work ahead as we think about the work in Appalachia and rural communities, but we feel lucky to have you as one of our national leaders speaking up on these issues. It's great to be here. Thank you.